Just like Earth, Mars also has polar ice caps and they are made mostly out of water ice. Although it is true that both of the ice caps are coated in a layer of carbon dioxide throughout a large part of the year, that layer is at best only about 10 meters thick, while the water ice layer is up to 3 kilometers thick. It's somewhat hard to estimate the size of the reflective carbon dioxide layer, as it is very dynamic. As the seasons change, it grows and shrinks. During winter, when the South or the North Pole is engulfed in darkness for half a Martian year, then the CO2 frost layer on each hemisphere grows to encompass around 10 million kilometers square. That is a bit larger than the surface area of the United States. An ice cap is even visible quite well through an amateur telescope during the Martian spring when the sun starts shining on the southern hemisphere. But it also almost fully disappears by the time it's summer. Then during summer, all that is left at the South Pole is a patch of carbon dioxide 400 kilometers in diameter and about 10 meters thick at best. That patch also sits directly on top of water ice. The water ice layer, which is likely around 2 to 3 kilometers thick, is visible through a topographic map, which reveals a mass that is some 2 to 3 kilometers above the surrounding terrain. And it is some 3 to 4 kilometers above the Martian datum, which is Mars's zero meter reference point. That reference point is akin to the sea level being the zero meter reference point for Earth. Taking a look at the North Polar Ice Cap on a topographic map also reveals a mass that is about two kilometers above the surrounding terrain. However, most of the surrounding terrain is nearly minus five kilometers below Mars's zero meter point while the ice cap is minus 2 to minus 3 kilometers below Mars's zero meter point. The seasonal CO2 ice layer sits on top of that flat 2 kilometer elevation, and it gets to be around a meter or so thick during winter. However, it largely or even entirely disappears by the time it's summer. So during the height of winter, specifically winter in the southern hemisphere, a few trillion kilograms of atmospheric carbon dioxide freezes. That's enough to cause the atmospheric pressure to drop significantly throughout the entire planet. The lowest pressure NASA's Viking 2 lander recorded is 750 pascals. That happened during the southern hemisphere winter, which is the northern hemisphere summer. Then during the beginning of the northern hemisphere winter, that pressure went up to 1080 pascals at the exact same location. So about a third of the atmospheric CO2 freezes during the southern hemisphere winter. That highest pressure of 1080 pascals is still only about 1% the surface pressure on Earth at the sea level. During the end of the northern hemisphere winter, the global atmospheric pressure also drops, but it drops down to a higher pressure point compared to the point during the southern hemisphere winter. Probably that is because the winters in the northern hemisphere are not as cold, so less CO2 freezes then compared to the southern hemisphere winter. The reason behind why the winters are colder in the southern hemisphere is possibly due to the pressure difference. The southern hemisphere is around 6 kilometers above the northern one, causing the pressure to be lower there which also lowers the temperatures. That is why also on Earth, temperatures are generally lower on mountains compared to the surrounding terrain. The pressure is lower the higher you go. NASA's Viking 1 lander also recorded the same atmospheric pressure drops as Viking 2 did, at the exact same time, also in the northern hemisphere, but 3,800 kilometers away. However, the overall atmospheric pressure is also lower for Viking 1 as it is at an altitude 1 kilometer above Viking 2. One particularly odd thing about the South Polar Ice Cap is that it is not exactly at the South Pole. It is a bit off-center. One idea as to why that is the case is due to the deepest basin on Mars called the Hellas Basin, which is influencing winds 
and with that also influencing where frost forms. On both of the polar ice caps it's pretty noticeable that there are from all sides these long valleys that cut very deep into the ice plateau. They can stretch for hundreds of kilometers, be tens of kilometers wide and several hundred meters deep. The way that these massive valleys formed is uncertain. Possibly it is due to wind delivering dust on those regions, causing them to heat up because the darker coloration of the dust makes it absorb more heat than the reflective ice. The absorbed heat then starts melting the ice and slowly over time the long valleys form. Taking a closer look at just one of the walls of these valleys reveals incredibly smooth layers that stretch for hundreds of kilometers. Likely the temperature changes throughout many seasons created these stacks of layered dusty water ice. A closer inspection of these would likely reveal something about the past climate of Mars. These layers in particular are located at the walls of one of the valleys at the North Polar Ice Cap. Another valley there with layered features is called Boreale. It is the largest ice valley on Mars. It is around 500 kilometers long and some 50 kilometers wide. Its walls are about one kilometer tall. Here is how they typically look like. Here is a satellite image showing the massive layered wall at the end of the Boreale Valley. The South Polar Ice Cap also has layers on the walls of its valleys. Here is how one particularly interesting layered feature looks like. The layers are very pronounced. The floor below the layered ice wall is also very bizarre looking. It's filled with a bunch of these reflective islands. Some have reddish tops but most of them are reflective and are likely CO2 ice that is in the process of being eroded. Here is another layered feature on the South Polar Ice Cap. This one is incredibly extensive. The North Polar Ice Cap is overall much more smooth compared to the Southern one. This image from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter shows how the top typically looks like. It has these massive flat and smooth planes. It is almost featureless, although occasionally there are small craters. Here is a satellite image of a crater at the top that is 70 meters in diameter. What was also found in the icy plains is an elongated pit that is 160 meters across. There is a possibility that the pit leads to a some kind of a cave in the water ice layer. On the other hand, this is how the South Polar Ice Cap typically looks like. It is way more chaotic. It's filled with these holes that are 1 to 10 meters deep. They don't go below that point because they are holes in the carbon dioxide layer that sits on top of a flat water ice layer. They are also somewhat dynamic. NASA's Mars Global Surveyor Orbiter showed that over the course of just two years some of the holes changed their appearance. These holes likely form and are dynamic due to the sublimation of CO2. Sublimation is when something goes from a solid directly into gas. But there are also holes that besides sublimation something else is going on to form them. There are these regions at the South Polar Ice Cap which form a fingerprint like landscape. The holes here are elongated instead of being circular which is typical. What exactly caused the formation of these is unknown. Some more evidence for there being water ice below the surface is this ghost crater in the South Pole close to the long lasting CO2 layer. It is a ghost crater because although there are indications that it is indeed an impact crater, most of the features of the impact have eroded over time and all that is left are these circular patterns. It was at one point likely many tens of meters deep, but over time likely the crater wall started slowly collapsing because it is rich in ice and the icy material flowed into the depression causing it to mostly fill in. Here is an image of another possible impact crater near the long lasting South Pole CO2 layer. It is 4 kilometers in diameter. On one side there is the typical hole filled terrain and on the other is the darker likely dust filled terrain. 
the possible impact crater itself has a very dark patterned wall. The floor of the depression is filled with CO2 frost and holes. There is also this circular pattern that seems to be the central point of the impact, but it is still a bit off center. Here is how a less ambiguous impact crater looks like at the South Pole. This one is 900 meters in diameter. A more zoomed in view of the crater reveals a small section, sort of a pool, that has lots of CO2 ice accumulated. The South Polar Ice Cap is surrounded by a system of eskers. Eskers are a type of pattern where ridges appear once the long standing ice retreats from the region. Here is how they look like up close. This is also evidence that the South Polar Ice Cap was much larger in the past, as these eskers are quite far away from the current permanent South Polar Ice Cap. Another thing that is also surrounding the ice cap is this massive crater. Although it is somewhat visible with real color imagery, a topographic map shows it very well. It is around 850 kilometers in diameter. A large part of the crater is also obscured by the massive Australia Plain, an extension of the permanent water ice cap. It also has a massive valley that is 300 kilometers long and 1 kilometer deep. It is also only visible well through a topographic map. Here is how one part of this valley looks like up close. It is thought that this valley formed through a certain type of wind which is called the fall wind. They are created when wind is rushing down from elevated surfaces downwards. The Australia Plain is also where there is some radar evidence for a liquid saltwater lake beneath the surface. The idea is that there is salt or something else that lowers the freezing point of water such that it stays liquid at very low temperatures. Another thing unique to the region and the South Pole of Mars in general are the geysers. It is thought that there are seasonal 1 meter thick ice slabs of carbon dioxide that once heated up during spring, the pressure builds up in the terrain below the slabs. And during the Martian spring, that pressure is then suddenly released, causing carbon dioxide, along with dust and sand, to shoot upwards at speeds estimated to be at a high end around 160 km per hour. The spider-like formations also likely formed exactly as a result of the pressure building up beneath the CO2 ice slabs. Sadly, as of right now, there are no successful landers or rovers at the South Pole of Mars. However, there was one unsuccessful landing. For some reason, the contact with NASA's Mars Polar Lander was lost on December 3, 1999, during the landing phase. It was supposed to land in the Australia region. There was still a successful polar mission, but at the North Pole of Mars. I'm talking about NASA's Phoenix lander that landed on Mars in May of 2008. It landed 750 kilometers away from the permanent North Polar water ice cap. It captured the cracking pattern that is present in the ground. The polygons are 2 to 3 meters in diameter. The likely reason for why they formed here is because of the ice beneath the surface expanding and contracting throughout the seasons as the temperatures change. The Phoenix lander even captured a patch of bright surface directly below it that is likely ice. Every winter on the North Pole, just like at the South Pole, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starts freezing. The CO2 layer even grows enough to encompass the entire region that the Phoenix lander is in. The last contact with the Phoenix lander was made six months after landing. After that point, the lander was spotted from orbit encased in a layer of CO2 ice. Likely the weight of the layer was enough to damage the solar panels, so any attempt to recontact the lander is likely futile. The polygonal pattern in the ground is not only present in the Phoenix landing site, but it is also present on quite a few other locations that surround the ice cap. 
Here is an image showing such a pattern, but very far away from the Phoenix landing site. And the pattern is even more visible here due to the reflective frost that is present on the ridges. There are also, however, the structured polygonal patterns at the South Pole as well. One particularly odd one is this one, located at a layered feature. Besides the Phoenix Lander, which is somewhat close to the permanent ice cap, directly surrounding the ice cap are sand dunes from nearly all sides. This massive dark area is exactly where the sand dunes are. A lot of the times, the sand dunes are somewhat scattered. Here is one image showing how they frequently look like. Between the sand dunes is a hard surface filled with polygonal patterns. They can also be quite densely packed together at times such as in this photo. The region where these sand dunes are located is called Olympia. It is the largest field of sand dunes on Mars. In the winter, the dark sand dunes get covered in frost. This image shows the period during spring when the frost is starting to disappear and the dark coloration of the sand dunes is being revealed. On top of that, what can also be seen in spring are these dark parallel lines going from the top to the bottom of the dunes. Possibly the dark patches and lines form when the CO2 ice starts sublimating. Then, as the CO2 starts rising up, it also then dislodges the darker sand that then rolls down the dunes. Here is another image of the same phenomena. The frost here is a bit more apparent on the dunes. Also during the Martian spring, another process was also captured, avalanches. They were captured in action from orbit. In this image is one forming a cloud 180 meters across. This was captured at the walls of one of the valleys that cuts deep into the North Polar Ice Cap. The fall likely occurred as a result of the temperatures increasing, and with that, the CO2 started sublimating, then a big chunk of the CO2 ice at the edge of a cliff got dislodged, which then caused it to tumble down a 700 meter cliff. When it reached the bottom, it disturbed the fine Martian dust particles, resulting in a massive dust cloud. It is possible that this is something that happens every spring, as this event was captured for at least two years in a row in spring. Very far away from the North Polar Ice Cap is this crater called Korolev, which has a massive amount of water ice. This image of the crater was captured by the European Space Agency's Mars Express Orbiter. This crater is 80 kilometers in diameter. Close to the rim, it has a depth of nearly minus 6,000 meters. However, most of the crater is elevated. There is this huge pile of ice taking up most of the surface of the crater. The pile is around minus 5,000 meters of depth, so 1,000 meters above the surrounding edge. The shape of the crater changes the temperature there such that it allows for permanent water ice to reside. It is estimated that it has about 2,200 cubic kilometers of water ice. That is similar to the water volume of the Great Bear Lake in Canada, which has a surface area of 31,000 kilometers square. It is the eighth largest lake by surface area on Earth. However, there is a permanent patch of water ice at a latitude even much lower than the Korolev crater. The Louth crater is 35 kilometers in diameter. This image was also captured by the Mars Express Orbiter, and it nicely shows where the water ice pile is. The water ice pile is around 13 kilometers across. It is a much smaller pile compared to the one in the Korolev crater. Still, this Louth crater water ice pile is the closest known surface water ice patch to the equator of Mars. It is at a similar latitude to the Phoenix lander, which is at 68 degrees north. Just like Korolev, the Louth crater acts as a cold trap. It is then thought that it traps the water ice vapor from the winds carrying it, and over time that accumulated the water ice into a single spot. 
Another idea is that the ice got there through a subsurface water upwelling. Still, as of now, there is not a certain explanation as to how the water ice got there. On Mars, a year lasts 687 days, nearly double the length of a year on Earth. So the seasons last nearly twice as long on Mars compared to Earth. And also the poles of Mars get engulfed in darkness for nearly one Earth year each Martian year. The length of a day for both planets, however, is very similar. On Mars, it is 24 hours and 37 minutes. Only 37 minutes longer than a day on Earth. Another large similarity between the planets is the axial tilt. For Mars, it is 25 degrees, while for Earth, it is 23.5 degrees. There is evidence, however, that the axial tilt of Mars changes by a massive amount unlike the axial tilt of Earth. One idea as to why that is the case is due to Mars not having a large moon like the Earth, so there isn't much to stabilize its axial tilt. Because massive changes in the axial tilt can also produce massive changes in the climate, it is then thought that the temperatures on Mars in the past at certain points were much lower due to the indication that the axial tilt was very low, closer to zero degrees, meaning the planet was less wobbly and more upright. That then caused for the poles of Mars to get even colder as they got less overall sunlight. The CO2 ice layer probably was, during those times, also closer to the equator than it is currently during the winters. The atmospheric pressure because of that was likely even much lower than it is today, as a large chunk of the atmospheric CO2 was frozen. The evidence of past ice ages on Mars is there in the regions that are relatively close to the equator, which have subsurface water ice. If that ice was exposed today, it would sublimate relatively quickly. But the fact that it bundled up in a spot relatively close to the equator points heavily towards the idea that there was an ice age on Mars during which water ice was distributed on the surface close to the equator. Then, as the temperature slowly started rising, the ice during that time got buried and it stayed insulated there from the higher temperatures. Although the Phoenix lander landed at a very northern location, it was still very far from the North Polar Ice Cap. And with the South Polar Ice Cap, there isn't even a lander in the vicinity. So we still don't exactly know how these ice caps look like from the ground. Having a lander, or possibly a rover, land in one of the valleys in the ice cap would probably reveal some interesting scientific data. But on top of that, it would also probably provide us with some great images of the permanent water ice. Still, at the moment, there are no serious plans to investigate these places further with a rover or even a lander.